horrible. I still relive it even to this day. Everything that I went through, because you don't think that this is going to happen to you. You think even then you believe that the truth is going to come out, that you believe in the system, that everybody can see that I'm not 5'10", 200 pounds and dark skin complexion, but you had a prosecutor that was something of a theme on law and order, right? You had jury members going to sleep, literally going to sleep, no mistrial. It was just a nightmare from beginning to end. I mean, that's a pretty long trial. I'm I'm assuming that your lawyer wasn't doing much. What was he doing, just sitting there listening? Nah, he was... He he was doing... I guess you could say he was doing... I don't know what he was doing. (laughs) To be perfectly honest with you, Jason, I don't know what he was doing. All I know is that it was a... The entire thing was a nightmare from beginning to end. There's a part in the trial, like if you go back and look at the transcripts, they even took my height, right? And they get out a tape measure and they take my height. So they see that I'm actually, you know, 5'4", and I'm only 5'5", with this one and a half inch heel on, right? Yeah, I mean, none of that made a difference to the jury. The fact that this crime took place within seconds, and you know, Um, Dr. Elizabeth Loftus say can't nobody identify nobody in two minutes, let alone seconds. You know what I mean? This is a a violent crime. You know what I mean? So, you know, if somebody runs into the studio right here and, you know, robs us right now, nine times out of ten, we all going to get it wrong when it comes to the physical description. Nobody paid attention to that. Right. And this crime, this took place. There was a chase. The poor girl was, after her, her earrings were stolen, she was shot in the throat. Right. Um, she was with a friend who was luckily not harmed. But we know right. also from decades of research that in cases in which someone is up close when a violent crime is being committed, we know that that person is much more likely to mistakenly identify someone because you're, and it makes sense if you think about it, right? Your adrenaline is going right. crazy. Your own life is threatened. Right. It's all that fight or flight and all those reflexes and impulses and all the nerve endings are, are going crazy. And there have been experiments where they, they've actually staged a crime. Right. And then they bring in people from the I've outside. And, they, and yeah. they found that, that people who weren't there have a better chance of being right. Than right. So we actually, those witnesses are not even as good as guessing. Right. So in this case, you had all of those factors, right? You yeah. Had, so you actually had three witnesses, you know, that testified, but you actually had over nine witnesses. And the other six, you know, didn't testify because they didn't say what the police wanted them to say. They actually said the opposite. What about the other evidence that showed that you were somewhere else? That evidence was withheld for over a decade. And which evidence was that? All right, so there was a a welfare receipt from the young lady uh, that I seen on the bus that instantiated my innocence as well, that the police went to her, threatened her, and they took the welfare receipt from her. Now, welfare receipts are done in military time. She had picked up her welfare receipt, and then she had got on the same K bus that I was on. So the receipt said 1303. They told her that it said 303 p.m. because she couldn't tell military time. So when she takes the stand, she says exactly what they wanted her to say, that she seen me at, you know, late on that day and not the actual time that she did see me. Right. So had they not lied about that, then you couldn't have been there. Because they know exactly. what time the crime happened. Exactly. So that that stayed hidden away. For that was years. one thing. Was there were there other things that were withheld as well? So the clothes that they said they took from my father's house that the police officers got on the stand and testified about and said they were the clothes that was used at the crime. None of the witnesses ever seen these clothes. They weren't cataloged and they suddenly poof disappeared. Right. And all this stuff could have helped prove my innocence. You know, going back to other evidence, there still was never two other people locked up. There's supposed to be three people to the crime, but only one person was ever arrested, which was me, right? So there's all these holes, you know, but it's all come from the same prosecutor and police officers. And the, and the very real consequence of this, aside from the obvious 
terrible injustice that was done to you and your family is the fact that there's no justice for Shadell Williams, not to mention that the citizens of Philadelphia remained in danger with these two or three guys, however many it was that actually committed this robbery and murder, being out on the loose because you were in there instead of them. That's the horror of the situation that that family hasn't gotten justice. And when you lie about something to someone, you dishonor the victim and you dishonor their family as well. So let's go back to that day of the verdict. Can you give us a picture of the courtroom that day? I mean, you had now been in the system for almost a year, um, but you still said you had hope and you still believed that no one could possibly convict you because you knew that you weren't there. You knew that none of the evidence matched. You knew you had alibis. Right. But you also knew that, you know, this trial had been sort of a, you know, for lack of a better word, I'll say it was a clusterfuck. And, right. And yes. So, but even with all of that, did you still have hope that the jury was going to do the right thing? I still had hope that the jury was going to do the right thing. Because I always had faith, period. Ever since I was a kid, I always had, you know, faith in God that, you know, I could get through anything. So I'm sitting there and I'm praying that the right thing is going to happen, that people sitting on this jury would be able to see through all the, you know, the lies and things like that of that nature that went on in that courtroom. You know, when you look at the physical description, when you're seeing that, Stuff just don't make sense, you know what I mean? And I had hope, so when they stood me up and then they read the verdict, it was like like somebody just knocked the wind out of me. It was like Tyson hitting somebody, you know. I, I immediately started crying. I remember my mom crying. I remember my sister rocking back and forth. I remember friends that I grew up with, men crying. Everybody broke down and just started crying because nobody could believe that this was happening. Because a lot of lives were destroyed on that day. A lot of dreams were destroyed. It was a horrible scene, you know, when you hear these cries and these wells and you you like in this moment that's so sad and like out of body, like you don't want to be in here and, and you, you know, and I'm shaking and I can't believe it. And then you said a few days later you were sentenced to death. Right. Which is the only thing worse that could happen than everything that's already happened. Right. And then you get taken... I get taken to um, Greatest Four Prison. From there you go to Camp Hill, and then you get your destination of what prison that you go to. So I wound up at Huntington Death Row after these other two stops of Death Row. You know what I mean? You get your first taste of Death Row. Um, and can you explain what that's like for the audience? Because it's- <sighs> that process uh, going on death row is um, your shackle, um, your feet and your hands are shackled. They got like a belt and a black box on you. You literally can't move. And they basically strip you naked, which is a very dehumanizing process when you come. They got the cameras on you and all that stuff. And then they throw you in the shell, you know, and then the nightmare gets even worse, if you can believe it. You know, um, prison is such a dehumanizing place. Prison is meant to destroy families and relationships of everybody. And being on death row, you're considered the worst of the worst, less than human. And you get it from all sides, you know what I mean? Even though you got people in general population that may have worse crimes, it's a perception about people on death row, like they're the worst of the worst, you know? So you catch it, catch it from all sides. What you got to understand, you can't be in prison for nothing like this. So when I say that I went through hell, it's actually an understatement to describe what I went through. I got it from every side, guards, prisoners. I was basically in a fight for my life just to be whole, period. And that is because the case was such a high-profile case? It was a high-profile case, but back then you couldn't be in prison for nothing like this. Anything that had to do with a woman or a child, you can't be in prison. This is real prison. I was in, you know, real situations where I was 
jumped. I was, you know, had to fight. You know what I mean? I had to defend myself. You know what I mean? I was jumped. I was set up by guards. I was rolled on by prisoners, so on and so forth. It was a living nightmare. Something that you never recover from. Something that, that you never get over. I got teeth in my mouth right here that are broke and fixed from stuff I went through in prison. You know, the battle scars are still on me and in my soul. My situation is just like what we all know that Khalif Browder went through. I went through a lot of that. You know, most of us have found out the hard way that getting into debt is easy, but getting out is hard, especially if your credit score isn't great. Now, thankfully, there's Upstart.com, the revolutionary lending platform that knows you're more than just your credit score. And it offers smarter interest rates to help you pay off high interest credit card debt. So free yourself from the burden of high interest credit card debt by consolidating everything into one monthly payment payment with Upstart. See why Upstart is ranked number one in their category with over 300 businesses on Trustpilot and hurry to upstart.com slash wrongful to find out how low your Upstart rate is. Checking your rate only takes a few minutes and won't affect your credit. That's upstart.com slash wrongful. And you were on death row for a quarter of a century. Yeah. I spent 25.5 years in prison, yeah. How did you maintain sanity? How did you maintain hope? I mean, you know, if someone was to meet you now, they would have no idea that you've right. been through this. I mean, right. you know, there's that saying that everyone you meet is fighting a battle you know nothing about, so right. just be kind. But this is the extreme version of that. I mean, everyone's going through their stuff. You don't know what anyone's going through. It right. might be a heartbreak, might have just lost their job. Who knows what you're right. We all have our, have our stuff. But this is a different level. Right. I mean, this is a, an extraordinary ordeal for anybody to, to go through and survive. And I'm sure there were a bunch of people that you met, a bunch of men you met on death row who, who didn't survive. I mean... that That is kind of trippy because when I was in there... Um, I seen people kill themselves. You see the body bags come in and you see the ambulance come in. You see people died from natural causes or what have you, or debilitating diseases. But how did you, like, what was it that, that allowed you to, you know, persevere and to not, not take your own life and not go down this rabbit hole that so many of the guys went down? So, you, so when you were in prison... For me to sit here and tell you that I never thought about suicide, that's a lie. Many times. Even when I was in the county. Because, like I told you, I was suffering so greatly. Um, and and nobody was hearing my cry. Like, one time I was literally going to take my life because I just couldn't take it. You know what I mean? I'm innocent. And I'm not getting proper representation. You know, everything is going on. You know, the cops done, you know, frame me, whatever the case may be. So for me, I once read this book by Victor E. Frankel called A Man's Search for Meaning. Mm -hmm. And in this book, he had this quote by Nietzsche. It said, he who he who has a why can bear with almost anyhow. And my why has always been my daughters and my mom. You know what I mean? Like, I literally connected with it so much. Because here it was. They had no hope. And he created hope for himself, and he didn't give up. You know, the stories he would tell the other people in the concentration camps about their family so that they could live and survive and have hope of survival, you know? And for me, I would do the same thing. I would visualize myself home with my daughters someday. Let's talk about your daughters. What are their names? My oldest daughter is named Fatima and my youngest daughter is named Kiara. And when you went to prison, one of them wasn't even born yet. Kiara wasn't born. Um, she was born one week after I was stolen away. Yeah. So you never got to see her until you got out of prison. My dad would bring her to see me a lot. The, the family would bring them to see me, but I never literally spent a day with them, with her until I got out 